Hi, this is Priyanka and I welcome you all to Sijan Wednesday webinars. For those of you who are attending for the first time, this is a community initiative by Sijan Technologies. As a part of this initiative, we host webinars every alternate Wednesdays where we get experts from different domains who talk on a variety of subjects like front-end technologies, UI UX, mobile apps, media, entrepreneurship, community building, digital marketing and many more. Today we will learn why managing your client expectation is much more important than the technology. We will also learn why it is imperative to understand how your client does business so you can decide what features are essential to their success. So it has you adding value, building trust, reducing the risk and actually making you money. I would request all participants to please type in any questions that you have during the presentation so we can take them up in the last 15 minutes of this webinar. I would now like to introduce our speaker for today's webinar. We have with us Susan Rust. Susan is Drupal Business Consultant at Drupal Anywhere. As a Drupal cons Consultant, she emphasizes on building processes to help shops scale their services while running profitably. Susan has been in Drupal since 2006 and has worn many hats in the business world and brings a well-rounded background of training, sales, client services, development, design and operations to her talks. So while you get hooked on to Susan's presentation, don't forget to take this conversation live on Twitter using our hashtag SrijanWW. You can share your thoughts by tagging us and Susan in your tweets using our handles at the rate Srijan and at the rate underscore Susan Rust. You can see both, both Twitter handles on your screen right now. So without taking up any more time, I think we should get started. Susan, over to you. Good morning. Thank you. Um, I'd like to thank Priyanka and Srijan for hosting me this morning. And it's very exciting to be speaking to a new network of people. Um, while you might be here because you know I'm in Drupal, this is really agnostic. It's a process that works for um, any kind of development. So um, I'm Susan Rust and we'll just keep on going. So uh, Priyanka is going to take a quick poll to see who's here and then um, she'll share the results so we'll know what level of person is here. So I will just mark mine and return the queue. So I like to reverse engineer um, things because if you know where you uh, need to end up, it's easy to work backwards. So today we're going to look at the result of client wrangling. And the challenge of any project is extracting enough information from the client to create an architecture document that makes sense. I often get resistance against client wrangling at first because it takes up a lot of time. But the fact is that you can spend time up front and get paid for it by calling it discovery or business analysis or phase zero. Or you can do it at the end when it's unpaid and it's called bugs and complaints. So uh, you spend the time either way and it makes more sense to do it up front. So projects have challenges. Um, web development is really hard work. Every project is different, every client is different, and it's hard to control the variables. Um, the variances, however, if not addressed, cause turnover and burnout, and these are very expensive issues if you're a business owner. And even if you're um, uh, on the team to constantly be training new people, onboarding and offboarding people onto projects, it, it all adds up. The solution I found when I was running my business is actually client wrangling. And um, managing unruly clients make for happier employees and for better projects. And so these are the five steps that I have outlined. There's really 150 steps, but let's just start with five today. So if we look at what this looks like, it all integrates well. And it's kind of hard to tease apart into discrete units. but I feel like this basically um, got it. So where client wrangling comes in is at the beginning of the project. And I try to outline here all the things that uh, we do in the development 
process. And most people are very good at this right here. Um, but And some people do a cursory of this or maybe even do it well. But uh, usually the beginning and the end get um, shortchanged both in terms of time and money and value internally. Sometimes people don't even value those things as well. But if you do client wrangling and you build yourself a good process, you can have happiness and ease with Drupal. So let's get started. The first thing that I noticed is um, closing the gap. You have to manage client expectations. And in general, engineers are terrible at this. Um, clients talk Greek and engineers talk Drupal. And they don't really often enjoy all of the conversation. They just want to get to how do I build it. And so there's what the clients know, and then there's what your team knows, and there is a gap in between that. You can cover that gap by um, doing training, but it's important to realize that this gap is a communication gap. It's not a technology gap. Drupal's not going to fail you. You're going to fail Drupal. So what happens is that, um, unfortunately, when companies decide to go get a new website, the website itself becomes a catalyst for rewriting or sometimes just writing their business rules. Like, how do you make a wheel? And how you make a wheel and how you sell it to your customers is what your company needs to know. But sometimes, internally, it's a very messy process. And clients usually need help making the leap from a manual process oh, I typed this up on my IBM Selectric, we scan it in, we turn it into a PDF, and then um, Clara on the third floor, we send a carrier pigeon, and then she uploads it to the website. Um, and so sometimes you have to dig down that deep into their business process and their business rules to understand what you need to build. Then as your team is kind of tuned out because this is all oh so boring, the client goes, oh, what can I have? And the typical answer is, oh, anything you want. Because what can Drupal do? Oh, Drupal can do anything. And so you've just now made your communication gap bigger because this is what has happened. The client goes, oh, Drupal can do anything, and I can have anything. You have just completely unleashed a big unmanaged expectation. Because their budget and their timeline, and now with what they want, um, no longer fit together. You're increasing the gap. Because I've never met a project that could afford all their features. So this is sample text. You'll see it again later. Um, so uh, one of my clients uh, uh, said, oh, we got a great project. Let's, let's have you come in and help us with discovery and the client wrangling part. And I read through 30 pages of content like this. And um, I said, no, you can't start. And they said, why? It's a lot of money. And I said, because of this. Um, inside of all of these words are all of these unmanaged expectations. And if you leave all these unmanaged expectations standing, um, you're going to have a terrible experience because what they have in their mind is not what your engineers have in their mind, and that's going to cause a terrible collision, a train wreck at the end of the project. So there are words that are loaded like extracted automatically. Well, you might be thinking, oh, the client will push a button that says download, and then a download will occur. And the client's thinking, oh, no, no, I want Drupal to know this and then just automatically download it for them. Um, and that sounds crazy to us, but it was actually what the client was thinking. Um, an easy navigation concept, um, that's a UX design conversation that's happening inside of these quote unquote architectural specs. And the fact that the client doesn't understand where engineering starts and where UX starts is a red flag. Um, this is very common. So if we look at 
a good concept can be found with Flipboard. What he's really saying is, I love Flipboard and I want those things in my website. And if you leave that concept standing, they're never going to be happy because they think they're getting Flipboard. And so um, not only do I shoot holes in that, I run over it with a truck and then um, I shoot it with a cannon. Um, it's very important to read through their documents and catch these kinds of red flags. So all in all, there were 30 pages of uh, sentences and phrases and words like this that were alarming. So um, this is a really good question. So I just want you to write this down on a piece of paper for yourself. Um, if, you, if I came in with a $100,000 project, how much of that do you think you should allocate to development? Not design theming, project management, uh, testing, or anything like that. Just development. Um, so write that down. And the reason you need to know this is because when you're talking to the client, what I see often is that Engineers go, wow, I've got $80,000 I can build stuff with. So they're having an $80,000 conversation with the client, when in reality, they should probably be having a $30,000 um, conversation with the client. And that's really surprising. But when you look at this, you can see that it really makes sense. One of the things that I see is that companies don't leave enough budget or time at the end for going through user acceptance testing, getting rid of the bugs, and then doing something that I call feature polish. Feature polish is that weird request that you're not wrong in having built it that way, but they're not wrong in making the request. Um, they're usually not big items, but they do take time. Like, oh, wouldn't it be better if this view did X? Well. Yes, it would. Um, and we're out of money, so we don't want to accommodate you. So you can do everything really, really well until the very end. And then when you're out of budget and they're out of money and you're all out of time and energy, that last 5% of the project can ruin everyone's memory of the project. And what you'll find is that if you do really good client wrangling on the front end, you don't end up with so many um, bugs and feature polish on the back end. So you're just reallocating that money. And then, you know, if you do it really well, you'll actually have um, a little extra to go towards margin. And that's always a good idea. So you're going to go from the slide I showed you with the giant balloon of their expectations, and you're going to compress it down so that things are in alignment. And so uh, we're going to talk about an MVP. So business owners sometimes don't like the concept of MVP. Like, why would I turn this $100,000 project into a $30,000 project? And there are actually a lot of compelling reasons to do so. Um, the first is you're not leaving it on the table. You're just not taking it right now. And that's a big difference. Um, if you do the MVP really well, you'll be surprised. Not only will you get the original budget, you'll get more. When you actually deliver something that works really well, really quickly, you build trust. Um, but on the other hand, what if you don't like the client? I have had a handful of clients that I just dreaded their calls. The team dreaded their calls. They were taxing and time consuming and difficult. Um, and so if you do an MVP, you can decide not to move forward with them. Or sometimes the project doesn't run a bullet. It's a fabulous client. They're trying so hard, but they have constraints and um, they have issues on their side and you just can't make it work. But if you do a little project, you can get them done and out the door. So when you do an MVP, two good things happen. One, you have a client that gets really happy because they feel like they found a partner that understands their needs. And on the other side, you have found a, a client that has reasonable expectations, they have a decent budget, and um, can work within a reasonable timeline. Time 
So let's talk about risk. Um, risk analysis is very important on the front end of a client, uh, a client project. And what we need to know, though, is where we're going to go. What is our destination? Because if I'm taking you to Everest, we have to talk about a different set of risks than if I'm taking you to the Amazon. One's going to be about how much mosquito uh, repellent and toilet paper can you bring, and the other one is going to be about how many blankets and toilet paper can you bring. So it's similar but different. So um, when I come in and, and rescue projects or do site audits, this is how I feel like everybody's been working. Uh, no one managed the client expectations, the development company has no process, uh, the teams have no authority to do anything on the project, they're just trudging along, and 100 small things. So how do we change this? Because this is not really a good business strategy. Is that we decide to understand and manage risk. So we go back to our client, and uh, unfortunately, a web project is often the catalyst for a rewrite of their rules. But the important part in managing risk is, are they coachable? Do they listen to your advice? Because if you are raising the alarms and they choose to ignore you, then it's risky for them, but it's also risky for you. You also have to have your arms around the whole scope of the project. What are the goals? How is your team going to deliver those objectives? Um, how do you know if you're done? What's a, what's a win for the client? And if you don't know the answers to these questions, why are you going forward with the project? There's usually never a really good compelling reason to go forward. Because even though you may not have something, um, you may have a big open slot and you need to keep your team working. So that can be a goal, but if you listen to that as I say it, and it's not that compelling. It means that you need more in your sales pipeline. And, but sometimes it happens, it's a reality. But you have to ask the question, can you manage the client expectations such that they'll be happy and you can deliver a win? One of the weird things that I see is that clients start dictating not only time, budget, and features, but then they start to try to tell you how to build Drupal. It doesn't happen in other industries. I don't go to Detroit and tell Ford how to build a car. Um, you don't tell your clients how to make wheels. Um, and so they shouldn't tell you how to Drupal. They should express their business needs, but now how to engineer the site. For instance, they can say, I need users to be able to like my posts. But that's different than use the Facebook module. Um, and the reason for that is if they dictate the module, sometimes it gets easy not to ask them why they want that module. And then they're wrong. And then you've built something um, that you didn't understand why they needed it. And uh, we've lost a lot of money. You also cannot accept the premise of what a website should or can do. Um, don't take the bait. Don't accept their assumptions about their business model and how it translates into Drupal. So what happens is that clients start talking about uh, their, their new website, and in their mind, this is what they're describing to you, uh, a champion racehorse. And they keep talking and explaining and sending you docs and forwarding you diagrams and all of this stuff. And they believe in their mind that this is what they're describing. The trouble is, this is what they're really describing. And if you don't tell them that this is what they're describing, then you've never closed this communication gap of what they're talking about and what it looks like in Drupal. This is where you're the architect, and you have to take this description and turn it into that. But they need to be clear that they are not giving you the information you need. So we're going to go back to um, this little snippet of text. And so these are 30 pages of client assumptions 
that they considered specs. And the shop that I was working on, because it was a time and materials project, felt comfortable moving forward. But what was going to happen is at the end, when they have built this, the client's going to make them build this, which means that they are going to sink another 500,000 hours unpaid into the project. And that's why it's so important to manage this risk. So for those of you that know Minecraft, that's a booby trap. So that spec from client uh, was 30 pages of booby trap. And that client refused to let me come in and do um, discovery for them. And so that goes back to a coachable client. If they won't go through discovery um, to get the right information, it's really, really a bad client and a bad project. So I discovered by accident the concept of storyboards. And I thought um, it was brilliant because, you know, it's only a 5,000-year-old concept called pictograms. But reality is in Drupal, um, well, Drupal is hard to express in words. And because the client never understands what you're saying, there's always going to be a gap. So um, I think that we have to do two things. One, lower their expectations on what they're going to get, and then improve reality. And so one of the areas that is often overlooked um, is booby trap number one, which is uh, finding missing stakeholders, users, and roles. So um, every role means additional functionality and features. And so often, because they are doing their work over here in business rules, they don't really understand how that translates into web technology. And so they don't understand exactly how the translation from their roles translates into web roles. And that's your job to figure out and map. But you have to really look for, in the bottom row, those hidden stakeholders. Almost always when um, I translate an RFP or um, client specs into storyboards, you end up with way more users and roles than they thought. Um, I'll show you a document um, in a minute where um, it, the original three-page Word document uh, with four roles turned into a 30-page uh, scope of work. So if you understand the client's business goals and objectives, you can surface hidden stakeholders and functionalities, and that will save you a ton of time and money at the end. Because often, they won't pay for that extra work, and you're compelled to do it. And it, this starts to become a bone of contention. So they'll describe their business process like this. And they'll go, oh yeah, this is what happens. Um, but then what you really find out is that there's a lot more to it. And so it's important to understand their business process. And now we have to turn this into Drupal. Uh, we understand what they do in human terms, and now we have to turn it into Drupal. But the challenge with doing that is now you're, you're translating it into a language the client doesn't understand. So think of it like this. If we had to go and build a submarine, we could go out and hire a submarine contractor, and then they would send us a bunch of specs, and we would look at them, and we would go, looks good, and we'd sign off on them. And then when we got in our submarine, we'd go, wow, these doors are really small. Can we make them six inches taller? And they're like, no, you signed off on this. In Drupal, unfortunately, when the clients make that same request, we go, okay, and we do it, and we lose money and time and energy. So we often try to write our way into a scope of work, and it looks like this. There's lots and lots of words on a page, and the client can't make any more sense of your views, panels, display suite, nodes, um, field collections, it's Greek to them. It's, it's worthless conversation. Spreadsheets, a little bit better. 
but that these are spreadsheets are much better internally um, for your team. But let's do it with pictograms. Um, the Assyrians, the Egyptians, the Mayans, the Incans, uh, all figured out that with simple pictures they can say a lot. And so we can reuse that concept here. So I have um, three ways that I use this, as you can see. And so let's look at that. So very simple, like now you've given people something that they can understand and sign off of. Are all these the users and roles that we're responsible for building? Yes. It doesn't mean that it's all the ones that are there, but it's all the ones that we're going to build. It's nice, though, if you know all of them. Uh, it doesn't always happen. And then uh, you actually take each content type and do a workflow with it. And I'll show you a bigger document later. And then the last is reverse engineering it so that you actually get the um, content management system part of Drupal in front of the client very early. Is this how you want your user to see their dashboard and manage the content? By doing this, this is where it's like, well, if you saw this and I sent this to you, you go, how do they manage their videos? And you can go, oh, we've never talked about videos. Let's talk about videos. Where can they upload their photos? Oh, there are photos. Let's talk about how we manage the photos. So this really becomes the litmus test for the features and functionality of the site. So if you just do one wireframe of the dashboard for each major user, you will save you and your team a tremendous amount of time. Because now they know what views they need to build. They know what the filters are. They know so many things about how the site's going to get constructed. This is a weird thing that um, I started doing because um, I got, I used to wear so many hats and I got tired of selling the projects and at the end defending the projects, right? So uh, we need to talk about technical debt because Drupal is a platform with a lot of technical debt and what burns out clients is that they incurred a lot of technical debt that no one told them about and so now they have this big expensive website that nobody can manage and they're mad. Um, it's bad for business, but it's also bad for Drupal. So I explained to clients that every decision along the way incurs technical debt. So for instance, the fact that they never um, pruned all their content for all these years and they now have 82,000 web pages, that's their technical debt that they incurred over time. The fact that they never created a um, filing structure, a name convention for all of their web files is technical debt that they now have to clean up. It's not your technical debt. Boy, they want to push that on you, right? And you're willing to clean up their technical debt, but for a price separate from the project. Um, a naming a convention for images is so simple and it's so basic, and yet most companies don't do it. And so you have logo, logo one, logo two, Untitled one, untitled two, like that's a horrible naming convention that they allowed to happen and that's their technical debt. So inside of Drupal, for instance, you can go with built-in Drupal search or you can go with solar. Solar is way cooler, way better, but um, it is also an external um, object, that, uh, platform that you're working with and there is debt that's incurred with that separate from going with Drupal search. If you choose panels over display suite or if you do um, Drupal modules out of the box straight from Drupal.org or you modify them and write custom code. So your clients need to know that they own that technical debt but your job is to explain how much technical the debt they're taking on with each option. And so I use um, this very simple matrix, and you can have any combination of X, Y. Um, but a minimum viable product that we talked about earlier sits in this green zone. And so um, you can take any request and map it to here. You can do uh, Drupal out of the box, 
light custom work, heavy custom work, and you can have the risk of doing that work. Let's say they want to do something like Flipboard and it's really heavy custom and high risk and then it goes into this zone. Or they want to just use the Facebook model module and um, just go with that. The same thing with cost. And so rather than arguing with your clients about what they should or shouldn't do, which can sometimes end up um, putting you on the opposite side of the fence, you let this matrix be the other side of the fence and you're just helpfully pointing out where their decisions are mapping. And then I have almost always seen clients move themselves into the green area. Or if it's a big high risk unknown thing to agree to move it to phase two. So let's talk about building trust. Um, you can only get trust in a, into a project if your team understands the client's business goals and objectives. So if you do steps one and two very well, then you have really gone a long way in building trust. But the other thing that builds trust is um, this. It's not having this because clients trust velocity. They don't trust this and this is their biggest fear. And in order to not have this, you have to give your team responsibility, which everyone does, and also the authority. So this is where the conundrum happens. Like if you're an owner that micromanages, this is going to be really hard for you. Or if you're a company that doesn't have strong process, this is also going to be uncomfortable. So you have to be willing to trust your team and give them authority and you have to have a process so that you everyone's clear on where the boundaries are. So I think it's really important. I tell people all the time, I I promise that I will not let you fail and I promise you that it's okay to fail and I I give you the authority to, to throw a red flag on the play. Anyone on my teams can stop the project at any time and be heard. It doesn't mean we're going to agree with them, it doesn't mean we're going to do what they say, but it means that they raised a concern and we take concerns seriously enough to stop and listen very carefully and then agree how to triage that red flag. Maybe it's like, oh yeah, that is a concern but we've handled it in this way, or oh my goodness, that is serious, let's, let's regroup. So having um, a process that allows for this kind of interaction honors your people as, as um, professionals, but it gives them control over their life as well. So this is how project managers should rule a project. There's a team of developers, engineers, and all of this, the client, <clears throat> And a good project manager is every bit as valuable as an engineer. They're the heart of every project. They make it happen. They keep it on time. They keep it on budget. And they keep everything moving. And so this is how they should be leading projects in your company. But mostly, this is what I see. I see them overworked. They're doing too many projects. They, all they do, basically, is put fires out all day because they don't actually have the training process and authority to do their job. They just have a lot of responsibility. So at the end of every sprint, for example, this is what has to happen for a project to stay on track. Depending on the size of the project, it could be four hours, it could be 40 hours. So you can see that if you're doing weekly or bi-weekly sprints, um, it's a lot of time to get a sprint closed and a new sprint open. And when one of these items isn't handled, the project starts to unravel. You have unmanaged expectations that start to build back up. You have lost velocity. You have a breakdown in communications. You have confusion, cost overruns. It gets very expensive. And then how do we communicate with customers? We can already see that we don't speak the same language. We have different expectations. Clients think they're describing something when they're not. And communicating Drupal is complex. There's a lot of moving parts to it. But a good place is to just start with the obvious things, like say no to bad clients, don't take bad projects, and say no to good clients when it's necessary. 
and um, and being able to speak frankly to your clients is very important. I do one called I do a webinar called um, Ugly Baby Meetings, um, Ugly Baby Client Meetings, and it's because there are times when you have to be that direct with the client. So projects require a lot of input, um, but they also need a lot of output. And so I believe in a separation of church and state. You should have your clients on Basecamp and your teams in JIRA or Redmine or whatever ticketing you use. Some people let their clients in the ticket system. I'm not a big fan of that um, for all kinds of reasons I won't go into here, but this is my preferred methodology. You can do Scrum daily. And my, um, my red flag for you today, if you don't take away anything else, is a lot of people use Agile terms. And one of the best big buckets of Agile is backlog. So backlog is great when you work internally and it doesn't matter how many things are in the backlog. You get paid to do it, whether it's big or little. But most of us are being paid for work, and so backlog doesn't work. You have to break everything into four buckets. Um, it's a bug, meaning uh, we demoed it, the client found a bug, or we found a bug, and we're going to fix it. It's in scope of work. It's an actual backlog item, meaning it was in scope. We are getting to it in a later sprint. It's a new feature, meaning that it's going to be in scope because it makes sense to add it to the MVP now. Um, I recommend you keep that to a minimum, but it does happen, um, but you have to now issue a change order because someone's going to have to pay for that. And it's next phase. And what usually falls into next phase are the things that are like the three threes in our, in our matrix because it needs architecture. It would slow development right now um, or it would create a cost overrun or things like that. So when something is just like big and bulky and complicated, you have to push it to the next phase. Don't think that you need to squeeze it in because you need to keep your MVP lean and light. And so even new features, I always try to push them into the next phase. But sometimes it just makes sense. Since you're doing this, you, can, you need to do this now. So if you use the correct terminology and not backlog, you will save yourself a lot of money. But how we get all this communication um, into the process in a continuous way is with um, storyboards. And I'm going to show you a storyboard right now. And I did this because I'm not an engineer and I have to communicate with clients. And it was just so messy and difficult. And I hated all of those 10, 12, 30 page um, Word documents. And then you say something over here and you go, oh yeah, we're not doing video, and you take it out of this paragraph, and then four pages back, wouldn't you know, you left it in over there. And we're seeing that same thing with the um, healthcare thing. In one tiny phrase, they left in a little phrase, and now all of the, the whole Obama healthcare thing, whether you're for it or against it is real relevant, is that now it's in contention. And the same thing happens over and over again with those Word documents. So I like to streamline it into this. We have our users, we have our content types, we have um, a workflow for each content type. An editor comes to the organic group, sends out an email notification to the teacher who logs in, and they land on the My Account page. Um, the editor goes to the organic group, sends out an email notification. Oh, I just did that one, sorry. Uh, the teacher comes in, sends out an email notification, invites the students who log into Drupal who go to my account. This is so clear, but what it does is let's talk about email notifications. What is meant by that? Like in Drupal, notifications can be a loaded gun because it can happen many ways. And so when I take this to an architect, he's going to ask me, what do you mean by notification? And then we can discuss it, come up with the best solution and then clarify it here. Um, and so this is another example of how the teacher is going to create this content type, upload these things, save the content, and then it's going to Workbench. 
this saves so much time. So for instance, right here, let's say that I did not have these two items, the, the video and the photograph. Well, the client can see it right then and there, and they can go, oh, you know, while they're doing it, I want them to be able to add content and their bio, but I also want them to be able to upload video and, uh, and, uh, and images. And then that lets you be clear that this is what's happening. So that's a storyboard. This is Palantir's document, which is lovely. Um, but this is an internal document. So what happens is that you get the storyboard and you now turn it into Drupal. Your client doesn't have to approve this. This is Greek to them. Your clients approve this, which they can understand, all agree on, and sign off on. And it doesn't lock you into how to build it. It's just what you're building. And so this, uh, you can just uh, Google Palantir spreadsheet, but this is how you're going to build it. And this is what you turn that storyboard document into. Um, this is another way to present it. This is what um, I did with SageTree on a big project. This project came in originally for with like three pages and twenty thousand dollars, and it turned into a three-page Word document turned into this thirty-seven-page document. So I'm just going to go through it really fast: users, workflows content types, and this took a tremendous amount of time. However, this project would have, could have never gotten built properly without it. So what you do is you actually create your storyboard, and then it moves all the way through, gets updated at the end of every sprint, takes in consideration all of the different sources of information, and at the end of it, it becomes the UAT. So now when you hand this over to um, your QA team or if you do simple tests, whatever you do, um, you can actually use this document to test. Can my user do this? Did my content do, do that? So the last thing I'm going to talk about very briefly because I'm almost out of time is um, false data. So many shops use Harvest and all these kinds of things and they think that they really know uh, their business. But a really simple litmus test is uh, open up three tickets in your ticketing system when it says build a view and see what you see. Maybe it's awesome. But usually um, I get something that looks like this. Build a view, eight hours. And it might have a few things in there, but the ticket really needs to have this. And you also need to have standards in your company, like what is a view? Do we hide this? Do we show it? Um, this is a pet peeve of mine. This is the default. Who has ever enjoyed hitting the pager to see the next 10 results and then the next 10 results? Um, why can't it just be unlimited? Most people have really good bandwidth um, and internet these days. But all of these things need to be covered and I showed you the spreadsheets and that's what those spreadsheets are for. So there's complete clarity on how the view gets built. Because if not, this is where you're losing money. So your developer builds the view, the one that says eight hours, uh, and then it goes to the PM who gives it to the themer who then sends it to QA, and then you're like, woohoo, we built a view. And then you send it to the client who goes, no, here are the 10 things I hate about that view. It goes back to the developer, et cetera, et cetera. So you might go this way um, two to five times per view. And so 20 hours later, the view is finished, and now you have 19 more views to go. So this is where projects hemorrhage money and frustrate clients. So those are the facets of client wrangling. Um, in the bucket of create process, that little ticket snippet was one of um, 100 different parts of uh, running a Drupal shop. But uh, I hope you learned a little bit. We've learned how to close the gap on expectations. Um, we've learned how to do business analysis. You've created velocity by giving your team authority. You have great communication tools uh, with your storyboards. And you've learned a little bit about ticketing. So now you know how to client wrangle. Um, so if you follow this process, um, 
a new client wrangle, you can get here. So I'm Susan Rust, and let's do questions. Well, that was a great session. Thank you so much, Susan, for sharing these valuable insights on client wrangling and sharing the key points to successful projects and happy clients. Um, oh, moving, you're very welcome. Yeah, moving on, I'm sure you all have questions. Just like Susan said, we have already received a couple of questions, but just in case you haven't typed them in, please please feel free to send, send them to us and we'll take them up one by one. Also, if you would like to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with Susan or ask your question personally on your microphone, please press the raise hand button on your control panel. Uh, before I take our next question, just another reminder, you can also take this conversation live by tweeting using the hashtag SrijanWW and tagging our Twitter handle at the rate Srijan. So our first question here is, by Rahul, who's saying, what should be the amount of technical debt in a project? Since you already gave an example about uh, solar search, most of the times what happens is you become more dependent on third party tools because your focus goes from building the project to making a search. Um, That's a great question. And there's not a, the right answer for that um, it's really up to the client and so sometimes you have to help them make that assessment so let me give you an example so a nonprofit with a small budget you should keep their technical debt down to super low but if you're working with for instance we were working with a major university here they had a, a IT team of 20 people they had six people that specialized in Drupal well we can take on more technical debt because they can manage it and they're happy to manage it. They, they get paid to do that, um, and it's not a problem. So you have to assess it for each client, and it's a good conversation to have with the client. They really appreciate that. It shows that you're thinking of something other than code. You're thinking of their welfare, and that's really meaningful to them. Good question. Right. Thanks a lot, Sujan. Uh, Rahul, I hope that answers your question. We'll take our next question up by Richard, who wants to know, uh, what happens to the projects where they wouldn't allow you to do the discovery? Um, it, I think that fall, fell into the range called um, uncoachable client. Like they, their assumptions were so strong and their opinion of their project that it was that racehorse, um, they actually did not want to hear um, my opinions that it wasn't a racehorse. And so uh, my recommendation to the development team was for them not to take the project, and this was why. And they didn't. Um, it was disappointing to them because they were really counting on the money. Um, but they had just rolled off a bad project like that. And when we talked about, like, does this feel like this? Did these kinds of things happen? They're like, oh, man, you're so right. And um, they were very glad to give it up because once I pointed out all these things and then we tried to get clarification and we tried to, to, to give the client the right tools to make these kinds of decisions because um, that client actually felt that that document was a scope of work and saw no value in actually producing a better one. And so that is a, a client that you can't win with. All right, Richard, I hope that answers your question. Our next question again is by Richard, who wants to know, um, often there is an opinion to approach projects architecturally from a US point of view, rather than a systems or a technical point of view. So how do you go about personally bridging the gap between the two in your discovery process? That gets very, very tricky um, because people, I, and yes, a lot of times people hire UX firms first, and then um, try to say, okay, engineer this. And that engineer this is very difficult. So let me sh share a really fun booby trap with you. Um, this was for, I believe, Lifetime TV back in the early days of Drupal 5. Um, they got beautiful comps, they built it, and then at the end, um, the PM said, you never built this feature. And they said, what feature? And it was five little stars up above the right sidebar. And um, they said, 
well, yeah, it's there. It's five little stars. It's like, oh, no, those aren't stars. It was this widget that did this weird on-the-fly magic. But they never questioned what the stars were. Um, everybody on the client side understood that that was a feature, but nobody caught that. Um, so that's why I'm not a fan of design first. But so the way that you can do it is actually um, start with the user dashboard and then start engineering backwards from that. And then, then you can kind of end up at the UX that you need for um, the engineering that you have. But you still have to do the engineering first and then you can kind of do the, the UX alongside or if you have the luxury do your engineering um, storyboarding first and get your basic set of wireframes and then use that to be the, the launching point for the UX conversations. I hope that was a good question. It's, that's a very difficult one in our industry. Um, thanks, Susan, for answering that. Richard, I hope that answers your question. Um, Rahul here actually did not get uh, ticketing properly, so would you actually be kind enough to go back to those slides and uh, give us a quick run through of ticketing. He also wants to know if there are any more references uh, that can help him learn more about it. Um, ticketing. So, uh, can 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 you type in um, how big your team is? That'll that'll that's an interesting um, position. So when when it's just one or two developers. Sometimes they can almost work telepathically. Like one guy can say, hey, they need a view, and the other guy can go, got it. Because they have worked together so long that they know in their process what a view is, um, that it will um, have infinite number of things visible. We, we, um, we do our filters this way. Like, but that doesn't scale. So the minute you get to the third person, that is a disaster. So what is really good to do is to um, not let anybody work on a ticket that looks like this. So you, this is one of those red flag areas where the PM and the developers both have to agree that they do not work on these tickets. So I learned this when I was working with a very senior engineer who was always tossing back tickets. He's like, I don't have enough information. I'm like, what are you talking about? Everybody else works on these tickets. And so we talked about it, and then he showed me what he needed, and it's like, oh, I get it. And so um, internally as a company for building a view, you need to go through all the configuration options. And in that spreadsheet, uh, the one from Palantir, all these fields are actually listed out. Like, are we using Ajax, yes or no? Um, are we using aggregation? Yes or no? Um, and, and these things allow the, the view to be built very quickly one time. It takes a lot to compile it in, in the originally, so it might take you an hour to build the ticket, um, to, to fill out the spreadsheet. But one hour spent doing the detail, and you know, the engineers have to do this for themselves, the PMs aren't doing this. The engineer writes out the ticket. And you go, well, if the engineer wrote out the ticket, he could have built it. Yes, that's true, except when he gets pulled off another project and now the new person is trying to build a view and they have no idea um, because this was all in the other engineer's head. Scaling your, your company and, and getting to success and profit is about having a process so that anybody can open any page in the book and understand what's happening and what they're supposed to do. That lack of clarity in that it's in the project manager's head or it's in the client's head or it's in this one engineer that's the lead but he hasn't informed anybody, all of that is what causes the breakdowns in um, the process. And ticketing is not the cause of that, but ticketing is a really good symptom of that. So if you open your JIRA and, and look through 10 tickets and there's not much information there, I guarantee you, you're, you're blowing the budget on every project because you can't build what you don't see. And so the ticket could be blank, but it could refer back to the Excel document, right? Like it could say, build the view per this document. Um, but if in the absence of that, 
everybody's always doing group growth every day at their desk. So people look busy and people are busy, but they're not being effective. Um, and you're, what you're doing is you're just going through this cycle over and over again. So what you're going to do is get your engineers to actually write all this down somewhere that maps to your process. Um, in um, Flongbugs and a couple others, uh, you can actually create snippets, which are like little um, scripts. And then you can have all these fields. Like you don't have to type it from scratch every time, right? Or you can have um, wherever you want to do it. But you can have all of the components. One thing that I do is that when you're building a view, you're never done until you build the user dashboard block. Like everything that's a view means that you, you, you're creating um, content that's aggregating. Any content that's aggregated likely needs to be managed. So you know you're going to have to surface that on the user dashboard, or most likely. It's very seldom because you're taking content, you're aggregating it, somebody's generally going to be responsible for that content. So why wait till the end of the project and then, oh, we have to build user dashboards. So that's, that's just one of my standards. And my standard for here is to, is to put zero there so it displays all. Um, just little things like that. And you, as you know, like you can click into settings and you can create internally your own company defaults. Um, I'm not sure if that completely answered the question, but if not, um, email me um, and, or tw uh, tweet me and I will try to answer more clearly if that wasn't what you were asking. I did not want to interrupt Are you. Are there any other questions? Yeah, sorry. I do not want to interrupt you, but while Rahul did not share what his team size is, he midway only he said that he's quite satisfied with your answer. And uh, but he okay, has no great. questions. Uh, we'll meanwhile we'll take up another question by Richard who wants to know what sort of issues do you face or do you come across where, when Basecamp is being used to manage the development and the client relationship? Mm. So ba uh, Basecamp is a terrible ticketing tool. Because um, that's not its intention. Basecamp is Basecamp's intention um, is to create collaboration, but it's not ticketing, and that's very different. So you can't conflate the two. Basecamp is very good for client communication. It's simple. It's lightweight. Um, it makes it easy for people who are not very tech savvy to be part of the conversation. It also creates transparency. So um, uh, the where I'm consulting right now and doing operations, they people tend to use their email. And the trouble is I just started three new people and I'm trying to onboard them onto projects where all of the information is in people's heads and their personal work emails. Whereas if it was in Basecamp, I could say, please go read this Basecamp, look at all the files, read all the threads, and then you'll they'll have a clear understanding. The other thing about communicating in Basecamp is that it will help you manage bad client behavior. So if uh, pesky client A can just email you constantly all day about annoying things, um, it's really hard to manage them sometimes. But if they do it on Basecamp, then you can let everyone see that kind of behavior and then you can address it, um, maybe with uh, uh, their, their manager or some uphill person or whatever. But it allows you to get that. Also, like whenever I have a meeting with clients, I actually uh, usually open Basecamp and and document the meeting as we're going. Um, or I have, if I'm I'm the one speaking, then I'll have someone else do that. And then we have like, this is what happened. These are the outcomes, and these are next steps. And then that way, everybody, whether they were there or not, has a clear thing. So that's how you use. Uh, Basecamp, but Basecamp doesn't have tickets, it doesn't have estimates, it doesn't have time tracking, it doesn't have all the things that you need for rich project management to know if you're making money or not. Good question. All right, uh, thanks a lot Susan for answering that. We will very quickly take up two more questions. Um, Cheryl wants to know if I'm a one person shop, is it time effective to do tickets? Well, I think the question is, 
one, how successful are you now? And if you're very successful, then I'd say keep on being very successful. If you want to grow, so here's where companies fall down. You're happily running along at one, two, three, five people, and your process is working fine. It's maybe not great, but it's working okay. Then you get in this very big project. Maybe it's double or triple the, the dollar size and complexity you normally do. If you don't have any process in place, you're, it's likely not going to go well because you might need to add on somebody, you might need to do something to scale, and not having processes, even if you're one person, means that you can never grow to two. And if you get something fabulous in and you need to go to four, you can't do it. So you have to decide for yourself. If your goal is to always be a solopreneur, then do what makes you happy and works. If your goal is to get to a team of five, then you have to build process in advance of growth. And process is expensive. It, it takes time. You have to think about it. You have to agree on it. You have to document it. You have to follow it. Um, but you can never grow and get to the next level of business growth if you don't implement process. And you'll see this. Like you'll see a company, and you know they go to camps, and you see their advertising here and there. And then one day they're like got this big magic project and now instead of eight there's 15 of them and then in about 12 months they're gone they're out of business and it's because they didn't have process in advance of their scaling and so all they did was burn money and disappoint people it, it's such a textbook um, business result so, so I hope that answers your question um, yes I hope so too she's quickly typed in another follow-up question um, she wants to know, is there a future documentation use, that is tickets, or is there a better project management tool that she can use? Uh, I'm sorry, say that one more time. Uh, she wants to know, uh, is there... Bianca, can you... Uh, yes, She's, she wants to know if there's another future documentation use of the tickets, or if there is a better project management tool that, that she can use. Uh, this same question okay. has been asked by another uh, attendee today who wants to know what is a good program for ticketing. So uh, if you're, a, so I like JIRA. Uh, I'm not very masterful in it, but I actually like JIRA. There's, um, they've done an amazing overhaul of their system and you can do all these add-ons. The only challenge with JIRA is it's very, very big um, and it's very robust and it can start getting a little expensive if you do all the cool add-ons. Um, right now, if you're a very small shop and you don't have um, you don't have designs of getting very big, you only want to be maybe one or two people. Um, I'm actually uh, using Teamwork. Um, I have a company with 15 people on it, but they don't do development. They're um, in a different industry. And so they, we don't have to have exactly the same kind of ticketing, but it does do tasks and it, it, it's very base camp like, but with a little bit of ticketing features. But for true uh, developer ticketing, I like, um, I like Jira. Um, I've used Fogbugs and I like that. It's just very vintage, but it's very thorough and it's very configurable. Um, and there's probably some new ones out there. You know, there's a lot to be said for uh, checking out new software new ticketing software because they often are um, they're, uh, lighter weight and sometimes they, they're a little slicker and easier on the UX. Some of the old things are, it's all there, but it, so let's talk about ticketing and project managers. So once you get, invest in a ticketing person, it takes a lot of time to maintain it. And then what happens if you don't actually dedicate a person to maintaining the ticket? even if it's your time, but actually realizing it, um, what happens is it stops being used and stops being um, useful. And then people go, oh, see, ticketing doesn't work. No, ticketing is technical debt. Um, but it's technical debt that pays good dividends. So um, yeah, so I would try out Jira. I like Jira with Kanban quite well. Right. Uh, I hope that answers the question, Cheryl and Carolina. Uh, we'll quickly take up our last question here, although it's slightly longer, so I would request you all to please bear with me. 
um rahul wants to know many times the development team is not allowed to give better options or the managers just don't listen to it because basically it is not being followed because of the hierarchical gaps between an in an organization how do you go about mm. solving this problem so that's one part of the question the other part is sometimes what happens is that a uh, development guy has to actually give an idea to the manager but they wouldn't listen to it or just won't respond to it properly and bring in the design element of it instead of helping and supporting out or implementing the idea so it becomes really difficult for them to convince the manager or show them how it really helps the company more or less i feel it's the same question that he's elaborated on so mm-hmm. uh, yeah can you please answer that that is such a great question and i think that's the crux of this and it's why this Often who comes to these webinars are um, lead developers, CTOs, and project managers. But really who needs to hear this are, I think, often are the higher level managers and the CEO, uh, CEOs. Because they sometimes get very divorced from what's happening um, you know, on the ground. And uh, this is a big conversation and it's a structural change in the company. Um, but if you come at it with this is how we're going to make you more money because at the end of the day your business owner wants to be more profitable and while this sounds like um, you know kind of like a coup or something very radical it's really about saying I have in my company really brilliant resources and I need to unleash that power and let them do their job really well And um, I've never met a developer that says, you know, I really try to blow up projects. Mostly I try to do shoddy work so that um, we spend a lot of time in QA. I've never heard anyone say that. And yet often the way employees are treated is that 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 is the truth. Um, So I think it's actually like maybe sitting down and having a a really in-depth conversation with your management team and saying, you know, what are your aspirations for this company? Let me tell you what mine are as an employee. And let me tell you the way that I think we should go on decision making. And if you make it more not about this one issue about um, we should do this or that for the project, but you talk about it more from a global change that has to happen in the organization and how it will make them more profitable. It'll help them reduce turnover because turnover is expensive. Um, you know, bringing hiring and bringing on new people, getting them productive because it takes a month for you to sit down, get your laptop configured the way you want to, learn all the projects, figure out what's going on. This process is to make everybody's lives easier. It makes development teams happy. It makes business owners happy. It makes the clients happy. So if that's their goal, then this is a way. A way. It's not the only way. There are many other things that they could do. And so um, if they're interested, have them call me. I'll, I'll convince them. I can talk about this all day. <laughs> so great question. Yeah. And then, know, you know, at the end of the day. Oh. Sorry. Uh, I just wanted to add on that he's typed in that is there something that can be done from the development team to convince the manager? Um, I think you could try to get them to watch this webinar. I think that that you could say I got a lot of value out of this. I think you could get your team to develop these processes and see how much you can do internally without them. If you can show how on this project you did it in this way and we made more money and had a more successful outcome, then Um, the way that we normally do it, that might be more compelling. And at the end of the day, you may need to find a company that agrees with this kind of business philosophy um, because you guys are all very valuable. And so, but most of the time, companies will come around if they see the value in it for them, right? Like you see the value in it for you, but if you can let them see what's in it for them, then they're more likely to say yes. And maybe start by a very small, simple project. Um, and like you know, like this project normally takes you 120 hours. And say, can we try this with our process, our new process that we'd like to do, and see if you can do it in like 90. If you can do something like that, then that ends up being a good 
good way to try it. All right, thanks a lot. That that was an excellent suggestion. Rahul, please get them to watch this webinar. Um, all right, now that we are moving towards the end of this webinar, I would request those who still have questions or any sort of feedback to please mail them at webinars at the ratesregion.in. I would repeat once again at the rate webinars at the ratesregion.in. Thank you so much, Susan, once again for leading such a knowledgeable session. We are pretty sure oh, that. You're so welcome. Yeah, uh, we're pretty sure everybody found your presentation very interesting and insightful. Uh, I'm sure and these learnings would people would actually be able to implement them and add more value to their clients and secure early wins in their project. Mm, a big thank you to all the attendees for joining us today and, and making this session so much more interesting and uh, interactive. Before I close today, I would also like to announce that our next webinar titled Documenting Design Patterns for Cross-Functional Product Teams would be hosted on 24th of January and would, oh, sorry, 24th of June and would be led by Dani Norden, the Senior UX Designer at Harvard Business Review. For registrations and more details, you'd be getting a mail from our site. So stay tuned and thank you so much for attending today.